The issue is how to maintain Hong Kong as a merchant city. They are billionaires by any standard in any country. Democracy. It's not going to be a war that can protect us from Beijing. The central aspect of the governor's policy is entirely self-destructive. Is it all worth it? No. There are more and more people are anti-patented. What I have to leave behind is a system which uh, meets the promises that have been made to people in Hong Kong. I don't know whether I can ever stand up and say, I'm a citizen of the People's Republic of China. I don't give a shit what's, what happened in China. This is my home. It is 18 months before the handover. Across the border in China, the People's Liberation Army struts its stuff for the benefit of a visiting delegation from Hong Kong. Not entirely reassuring when Beijing has just warned its future subjects against the perils of democracy and freedom. Martin Lee is Hong Kong's leading Democrat. China regards him as subversive. To a lot of people in Hong Kong, this is our last ditch battle. We have lost on the legislature because this legislature will be replaced by a provisional one, and now it's human rights. And human rights is the most important thing to every person in Hong Kong, rich or poor. Nobody wants to remain in Hong Kong if his or her freedom is to be deprived. Right, this afternoon, what's, this, what's the latest? Human rights was now at the top of well, the agenda know. in Government House. In uh, news terms, the, uh, the big interest is going to be what you have got to say on the... Uh, the Bill of Rights issue. Drag it back to, the, to yeah. the main issue, which is the PWC proposal. Well, in China's interest. The main issue is are the people of Hong Kong confident that their way of life, that their civil liberties are secure after 1997? Yeah. That's the main point. You know what the answer is. The Chinese foreign minister has just launched an assault on Western values. Nobody now can seriously believe that the argument has been about um, whether or not we somehow broke the joint declaration and the basic law and the understandings and agreements between the two sides. Nobody really believes that. The argument was put very clearly the other day by Mr. Chen Chi Chen, who said Hong Kong shouldn't be about aping Western democracy. But the joint declaration is about establishing democracy in Hong Kong. That's what China signed up to, the development of representative government. So don't let's have any more pretense that somehow the argument's been about the, the triple violations. The only violations uh, that there may be will be from the Chinese side, and I hope they don't happen. China's threat to roll back Hong Kong's freedoms even worried Beijing's apologists. I hope the Chinese officials realize that Hong Kong is a very important place for China. That they can't come in and tell Hong Kong what to do. We did nothing wrong with the Bill of Rights. I think uh, the Hong Kong people doesn't want them to screw around with Bill of Rights. For once, anxiety about China's intentions united the British colony, prompting Beijing's foremost political ally to confront his patrons directly, though in secret. I stood my ground and I told my friends in Beijing that we believe it's a violation of basic law to ask the 
Standing Committee of the Chinese National People's Congress to, you know, replace existing laws in Hong Kong uh, with whatever uh, they feel um, acceptable. With the deadline at hand, there was a rush for UK passports, even though they gave no right of abode in Britain. We, the Chinese people, should be looking forward with joy to the glorious day of reunification with China, the 1st of July, 1997. But look at these Chinese nationals, people who have come to Hong Kong from China, queuing up in the dying days of the British Empire for a pretty useless British passport issued in Hong Kong. I think tells a lot. On his first visit to Hong Kong, the Foreign Secretary came under fire. You said in your speech, you will discharge Britain's responsibilities towards Hong Kong fully and honorably. How can you do that if you abandon Britain's citizens to Chinese communist rule? This was an issue I know which was looked at very, very carefully. I want to be frank with you. I do not see the basis on which that policy is going to be reopened. There is no pressure in the House of Commons from either government or opposition parties to do so, and therefore I do not believe it's going to happen. Do well, you not have a conscience? Do you not think it's disgraceful to hand these frightened people over to a regime from which they fled and to which the British have given them shelter for so many decades? Well, we all have consciences and we're all seeking to do the best we can in what are very difficult circumstances. A cross-party delegation from the colony hurried to London to lobby Westminster. What time did you have some exercise? We did. Well, <laughs> Please, they said, more British passports and visa-free access for all. They were heard in sympathy by some, but got nowhere where it mattered. Uh, Home Secretary, could he use his flexibility on uh, the number 225,000? Yesterday we, had answers, no. we did not expect the meeting with the Home Secretary to be particularly positive or pleasant, but uh, we didn't expect ourselves to be so absolutely right about our expectations. He basically said no, 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 no uh, to all our questions, except the last one, which was, yes, I refuse. I could see no reason for change. Um, I tried to deal with all the arguments um, on their merits as I saw them, I listened very carefully to the arguments that were put. I was always open to persuasion. The governor was at one with the delegation, and he was not about to take no for an answer. I think there will be a very, very nasty anti-British backlash in Hong Kong if we lose. And I think it will make um, governing Hong Kong a lot more difficult. I think it will also mean that we leave um, behind us a pretty nasty taste in people's mouths. <laughs> The Prime Minister was alerted, and just before this, his farewell visit to Hong Kong, Major persuaded the Home Secretary to yield and to grant visa-free access to Britain after all. Patton had got his way. I think you always have to be prepared to listen to arguments. You have to be prepared to be persuaded. And in the end, I came to the conclusion that there was some political advantage in making the change and that the disadvantage in terms of future immigration control was manageable. On the day the news was announced, Major was treated like a conquering hero, except, that is, by one section of the community. Like 5,000 others in the ethnic minorities, the Harry Leelas had very little to celebrate. I don't have a British passport. My younger, yeah. She was born in Hong Kong, lived in Hong Kong. I was born here. I studied here, lived here all my life, and you don't have a British passport. And his son don't have also. Yeah. Okay. We, we feel we've been abandoned. We do feel that way. At least I know I do. Patton lobbied harder than ever to secure British passports for them, but the Home Secretary again said no. He says that he thinks we've gone as far as uh, um, we should go, and he is adamant that the government shouldn't go any further. You have to remember that this was a question that had been very carefully debated in 1990 at the time the original legislation had gone through Parliament. And a considered judgment had been reached that full citizenship should not be granted to the ethnic minorities in Hong Kong. 
And I thought that if that was to be reopened with new legislation and all the risks that that involved of reopening the whole question of immigration from Hong Kong, you had to establish that something had changed quite significantly since 1990. And it wasn't easy to identify uh, what important change there had been. And what do you think of that response? Uh, I think that um, come the 30th of June next year, um, it's inconceivable we, that we can be in that position. When the Falkland Islands were in, invaded, Britain ran there immediately. And here we are, just a few a handful of people stranded out here. It kind of makes you feel like, you know, probably we're not white. She is um, trapped in the explicitly racist nature of Chinese nationality policy. And the British Home Office, and precisely how you describe the British Home Office's attitude on these matters, and precisely how you compare it with Chinese nationality law, I leave to you. I don't know what was in Chris Patton's mind when he said that, but there's no justification for that whatever because we had always made it clear, and the Prime Minister made it crystal clear when he went to Hong Kong, that if the ethnic minorities came under any pressure to leave Hong Kong, they would be admitted to Britain. And uh, that was clear from the word go. It was made clearer when the Prime Minister went to Hong Kong. And so I don't think there is any basis whatever for suggesting, uh, if this is the suggestion, and it's what you've put to me, that there was anything racist at all in the, in the Home Office view. Patton was not prepared to leave it at that. To do so, he thought, would be unwise and dishonorable. I think it would be regarded by a lot of people around the world as pretty shameful. And to you personally too? Yes, because uh, um, I think it will be something of a failure on my part um, if I don't get a better deal for them. The governor was also at odds with Whitehall on another front. Britain's overall relations with China had marginally improved, and one or two officials at the Foreign Office had put it about that this was because Patton had been sidelined. It was irritating, but I tell you why it was most irritating. Um, not really because it bruised my ego, though it would be um, dishonest in the extreme to pretend that occasionally um, that sort of thing doesn't piss one off in a fairly substantial way. Um, it was um, irritating because there was a really good story um, for Hong Kong to tell, and quite an important story, which got completely screwed up. That story was that British trade with China was flourishing and Hong Kong was booming, despite the row over freedom and democracy. So what happens? Instead of that being the story, the story which spins out, it's as though the new China news agency were running the Foreign Affairs News Department. The story that spins out uh, is that, um, oh, we've managed to do all these deals um, uh, with China because uh, we've bypassed um, Hong Kong and, uh, you know, clever old foreign office in London has done it all. With just over a year to go, a site is chosen for a grand farewell. Much detailed preparation. OK. Government house, Kim. And the handover. Start with crests. Yeah, we want okay. to be in a position in which the crests can, I mean, all these things, yeah. can be removed at the last moment, yeah, as they, it were, they, on the 30th of June. Yeah, the main gates, um, they're not actually welded on, um, so that they should be fairly easy to remove. <laughs> 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 I see these now in the middle of my gates at Dungovenin when I... Uh... <laughs> Presumably things like pictures are mine, are they? If they're signed to you, then yes. We still don't know what they're going to do with the house, do we? I mean, are they, uh, are they likely to uh, turn it into a museum of British atrocities? As, uh, The governor's conflict with China had turned even the handover ceremony into a battleground. First of all, they wanted to have a ceremony in the city hall. 
we would, as it were, sign a piece of paper saying, um, here's Hong Kong, we're sorry we've been here. There'd be a glass of warm Asti Spumante. A flag would go down and a flag would rise. I'm not going to connive at us leaving Hong Kong with our tail between our legs in a sort of hole in the corner way. It's not on. On a trip to America, the governor let slip his frustration with Hong Kong's tycoons, especially those who attacked him for standing up for freedom, but who also had British passports in case China turned nasty. On his return, they organized a reception for him. The governor was unimpressed. I would be dishonest if I didn't say that um, it does sometimes make me extremely angry. It's so devious and dishonest, and it's so deeply dishonorable as far as the people of Hong Kong are concerned. Patton never spoke so bluntly in public, but Beijing's allies were clearly affronted. We business people in Hong Kong are for Hong Kong, and it is because of us that Hong Kong has prosperity. Obviously, whatever we do will automatically be in the interest of Hong Kong. Whereas Governor Patton was leaving in a year and he hardly knows anything about Hong Kong before he came to Hong Kong. The tycoons wrote an open letter to the Prime Minister demanding an apology. Major gave them short shrift. Well, you know, the chambers have met this afternoon, James Teen and Henry Tang, and uh, they've said that, uh, uh, you know, in response to the Prime Minister's letter, that it wasn't really adequate, and, and uh, they want the governor to write a letter to Newsweek. One of the things they all say is, we want you to know, really understand this, we're not against democracy, we are not against human rights, not against the rule of law, not against standing up for Hong Kong's autonomy. Um, you know, you've just got to do it in ways that um, aren't so provocative to China. So you say, okay, take the, um, take the Bill of Rights. I mean, do you think it's a good idea for the Chinese to uh, gut it in 1997? Uh, Oh, well, you know, I'm not entirely sure about that, but, you know, um, I'm sure even if it's slightly changed, it won't make all that much difference to Hong Kong. Mm. I mean, there is never, ever a trench that they'll fight in. Ever. Anyway, it meant it was another sort of um, balls-aching week after the... Um, fortnight of activity in uh, Washington. But this job will never be entirely predictable. I think I should say that both the Prime Minister and the Governor have made our position perfectly clear uh, on, uh, on this issue. We've got nothing to add. Uh, we, think, uh, we think it's time to draw a line under this unfortunate issue. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the last bit in cooperation with the business community. Bugger them. Look at this bread. Not quite enough salt. It's their first effort to... Sorry, it's wrong on this. Mm. You think that's enough salt? You've been on a, on a diet. Yeah. The first day was cabbage soup and fruit. The second day was cabbage soup and vegetables. The third day was cabbage soup and fruit and vegetables. You had a baked potato one. That's vegetables. The fourth day was cabbage soup and bananas. <laughs> and I'm never going to get to the fourth day again. Cabbage oh, no. soup and bananas. Yuck. What was, the purpose, what, was, what was the purpose of these? To introduce a little more discipline into my life. But I, having drunk so much cabbage soup, I now understand Central European history. Twelve months to go, and the Deputy Prime Minister arrives from Beijing to offer reassurance about China's intentions. China makes no sense at all for China to undermine the success of Hong Kong, as uh, uh, Premier Li Peng put to me during the course of our discussions. There is an interwoven relationship between the two economies. And as the, as the, the President himself said to me this morning, quite rightly so, one of the great challenges for China is to raise the living standards of her people and to the body language of, uh, of uh, everybody concerned was actually probably as entertaining as the Deputy Prime Minister's performance. Certainly the Hong Kong-based uh, British foreign correspondents uh, uh, didn't think much of it at all. I'm afraid the, uh, the simple result of that is going to be some uh, 
some headlines that are simply going to talk about uh, not just a cigarette paper between the governor and Mr. Hazeltine, but uh, uh, maybe a whole packet of cigarettes. Hong Kong's Democrats were furious. I was not fortunate enough to actually meet Mr. Hazeltine face to face, but I'm really quite tired of having these uh, British politicians coming to Hong Kong, not really caring, not being well briefed, uh, and being extremely pompous. Uh, I don't know whether it's the special relationship we have with Britain being a colony, but they come here very patronizing, telling you what to do and what the situation is and so on. It's absolutely ridiculous. Wish you stay at home. Don't come. Don't come anymore. <laughs> I, I have to say that I, I was very astonished that at this day and age, someone who is in such a senior position in the British government could come and tell us, what are you worried about? There's nothing to worry about because clearly it is not again, it, not in, in China's interest, not in Britain's interest and not in Hong Kong's interest to wreck the future. I mean, we've gone past all that. It seems totally astonishing and if I may say so, quite insensitive because we are worried stiff. The Apple Daily was doing better than ever, but Jimmy Lai was anxious to move on and out. Only one thing held him back. I've got to stay there, I know, because for, for the moral obligations, I can't leave my media group and not carrying them through 1997. The reason for wanting to go was his family. Their flat had been burgled and Jimmy had been beaten up. Hong Kong no longer seemed like home. They feared it would get worse. I would say that sometimes I really want to leave Hong Kong and go to a very um, peaceful place that we can raise our children in a peaceful environment, then I know that Jimmy has a big responsibility in the community in Hong Kong. People do look up at him, and uh, we, can't just leave, we can't just leave this place. If I leave the media business before 1997 and let the people run it and I, I just go away, and stay away from the heat, I don't think I can raise my head and walk tall again in my life. As a rich man, I don't just want to leave money to my kids. I want to leave some dignity. And I got to show it. I'm right now studying the Open and Lincoln Studio of right. Hong Kong. What are you studying to become? Social science degree, sir. Well done. Well, good luck. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much indeed for everything you've done. Thank you, sir. As their commander-in-chief, Patton had to oversee the demise of Hong Kong's armed forces, accompanied here by the regiment's equerry for the day, Captain Lam. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> I, so I follow your base. <laughs> Each time you go and to another disbandment parade or another closure, then it's sad, um, and it's sad every day. You know, you, there's always a slight prickling behind the eyes when you see a Union Jack come down at last post. For the commander of the Hong Kong garrison, there was another regret, and it was a matter of honor. I think we should have given them a proper British passport because they have served the, the Crown loyally, and they are in a different category to all the other uh, uniform personnel here in Hong Kong. You serve in the police force, the fire service, the civil service, the law courts, anywhere else you like, then you still have a job here post-1997. At the end, we've been rather mean-spirited in not giving them um, unequivocally a passport in recognition of their service. I think that's a great shame. That feeling was shared by his officers and men, including Captain Lam. I have uh, a long service in the army, and I never regret that I joined the army. But unfortunately, I can't <laughs> serve any longer. So really, I have a, a terrible feeling inside. I would say, really, every serviceman, because we really serve the British Army, we serve the Queen, we, we take everything to the, 
to the Queen while we joined the service. To me, I was saying everybody should have a passport. Uh, like today, I'm sure inside the heart of most of the servicemen or ex-servicemen, this is a sad occasion. <laughs> Six months to go, and there's a demonstration outside the convention center where Chinese leaders are to preside over the selection of Chris Patton's successor. This is a very important day for Hong Kong. It's the first time in our history that we get to elect our own chief executive. And I have no doubt in my mind that China will give their approval and agreement and will appoint CH as the first chief executive for the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. The choice of C.H. Tung as chief executive did indeed seem to be a foregone conclusion, despite the elaborate theatre designed to suggest otherwise. Hong Kong people have absolutely no choice in the selection of the chief executive. Um, everybody knows the final decision um, will be made by China, and I believe the decision has already been made. So did everyone else. Some months earlier, they had seen the Chinese president make a beeline for CH, as if to anoint him for the job. Nonetheless, there were officially three candidates, and there was a scoreboard, as well as 400 electors hand-picked by China to ensure the right result. The atmosphere was not exactly charged with suspense. Definitely how the, all of the people feel about it. We have a sweepstake. Yeah, we should. Well, I'll, I'll go for the 318, as that, as that uh, came from MCNA. In Government House, ribaldry held sway. Nice Okay, 324. That's the talk. Yeah, the winning candidate. <laughs> <laughs> At the convention center, the ritual went on and on and on, certainty in slow motion. There was only one real question. Who's coming second? They keep chopping and changing. I think um, TL Yang. Eventually, they needed another scoreboard for CH. Even Beijing saw the joke. Uh, I'm not too worried about the actual outcome. <laughs> I'm fairly convinced that CH at this stage will win it. Yeah. Stop, Stop it now. Stop, Stop, the clock. Stop the clock. At last, the result. <laughs> the NCNA with three hours. The NCNA with three hours. I mean, but they, so they do that, you know, just to show <laughs> that the like thing isn't rigged, basically. <laughs> the new chief executive was a shipping magnate with a reputation for integrity. Deeply conservative, old-fashioned, and loyal to Beijing. I think he has really an outdated view about what he can do to the political culture in Hong Kong. He really thinks that democracy is bad for Hong Kong. He really thinks that the government should not be so open. He, he really thinks that demonstrations should not uh, uh, be allowed to, to run free. Within weeks, China set up the provisional legislature, the rubber stamp for Beijing that Patton had once thought would never really be established. Among others, Alan Lee had no qualms about signing on. What do you mean, exile? You must be joking. <laughs> Fifteen months earlier, he'd been proud to win after a free vote. His selection to this body was by a committee appointed by Beijing. The, the, this is uh, more of a government in waiting. Uh, we're getting our work started. Whenever there's such a major transition, some overlap is quite understandable. And also, we're working for the interests of Hong Kong people anyway, so I don't see any conflict of interest either. China now had in place precisely what was required to ensure that Hong Kong could be indirectly or even directly controlled from Beijing. We've read in recent days about the cloning of Scottish sheep. We now see that it's possible to clone Chinese political institutions. Um, and uh, this, this body meeting in Shenzhen uh, uh, periodically um, is exactly the sort of body um, which the Chinese would have been happy for me to um, have set up and taken the flak for setting up. This fact embarrassed one of Beijing's favorite sons, who in private was remarkably candid. Of course, the provisional legislature is, is not democratically elected. But, well, that's all beside the point. As the chairman of the DAB, chairman of the 
very often called the biggest pro-China party in Hong Kong. You must support the establishment of the uh, provisional legislature. It is, it is, um, you know, matter of, of loyalty. It is not a question of, uh, you know, your interest or your uh, preference. So I have to do it. I mean, it is not only, it is not only um, uh, myself, but the whole party as well. You have to do it. But personally, if you were a free man, you wouldn't do it. But it would be a very negative way of putting it. Confidence in the new chief executive soon plummeted. Well, Big Brother is already here and in control. Beijing clearly uh, wants this provisional legislature to do the dirty work for them by enacting repressive laws to enable the future government to suppress human rights in Hong Kong. And these laws all had to do so far with the freedom of expression, freedom of the press and freedom of assembly, of demonstration. I doubt if our administration, our government here is going to impose certain unreasonable restrictions on people's um, freedom of speech. But I'm sure that Hong Kong people will realize that that is not a role that we Hong Kong would aspire to because we're not really a political society. Okay, go. All right. Um, we've got a, a very sort of simple plan here, a model here, just to try to help, sort of help you to see it in context and just to help further that. The blueprint for the farewell ceremony was now in place. If you look on stage, you can see one person there. But the governor's mind was elsewhere. I think that's Frankly, I'm counting the days because um, there isn't very much I can do now to... Uh, change or fix the agenda. There's not much reassurance I can give uh, about the future. I find myself giving endless interviews in which I'm asked uh, what I think is going to happen in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, I find myself repeating the same parrot-like, repeating the same formulae. Um, so I'm, I shall now be um, um, pleased when it's the end of June. <laughs> Others were already on the way out. A troop of expatriate civil servants departed by sea, leaving behind uncertainty as well as sadness. Would their successors be free to stand firm for the rule of law and against corruption, free to keep Beijing at bay? One of the governor's closest advisors, his press secretary for the first three years, was very far from optimistic. You know, someone said on Chris's first day to him, I think it might have been you, this is the great story because it's the last British colony hand handed over to the, the last nasty communist re last regime on earth. Well, that's not a very nice thing to be part of. What's there to celebrate? That's my point. But I can't say that. It's not fair to Chris. Because okay. he tries very hard to, you know, to believe that it might work. In reality, he knows bloody well that it won't. The advance guard of the People's Liberation Army arrives to prepare for the takeover of the Hong Kong garrison. The British are not without qualms. They are a conscript force of three million with the largest standing army in the world. And I actually can empathize with the, the problems that the, um, the future garrison commander will face here. Because, for instance, um, his soldiers coming here, his private soldiers coming here, are paid enough a month to buy one beer a month in one chai. Their, their total salary? Their total salary, yes. 40 yuan. The general worried about PLA discipline. I think it's one of the greatest dangers to the future would be to have a PLA garrison here which was isolated from the realities of life here without any context. Because isolation leads to misunderstanding and because the PLA has a bad reputation in mainland China for abusing the civilian population and being above the law when it does so. 
confidence was fragile and easy to shatter. It nearly happened when it was reported that 50,000 British passports given in secret to key individuals to persuade them to stay on would not give them protection against China after the handover. Patton hurried into Ledgeco to steady their nerve. What I hope has been said at every stage is that a passport acquired under the British nationality scheme is the same as the passport that I've got. And it gives you the same entitlements in Hong Kong as in Papua New Guinea or Panama City or Patagonia. Anywhere you have the right to full consular protection unless, unless there is evidence, uh, satisfactory evidence of dual nationality. And that was the rub. At Britain's embryo consulate, they knew that China was unlikely to recognize those passports. If we turn up to a Chinese jail in which a holder of a British citizen passport is languishing, and we say, um, we demand access to this person, we demand to be able to help him, he is a British citizen. If the Chinese say he is also a Chinese citizen, then you have a problem. The reality is, isn't it, that if the Chinese say, sorry, you can't see the guy, we know he's Chinese, he's not British, you haven't got a hope in hell of seeing him. If it comes to that, if it comes to that, that's pretty much where you are. We don't want to go reminding people of, of Hong Kong about that. And we certainly don't want to give the impression that that's the end of the game. Because whether the guy's a dual national in, in, in our eyes, whether the guy's only Chinese in their eyes, or whatever, if the person is in distress, we'll do our damnedest to help him. There was some good news, however. After long months of lobbying at Westminster, Patton finally won his battle with the Home Secretary to secure passports for the ethnic minorities. Hi, Howard, once again outnumbered and outgunned, had decided to back down. It became clear that the legislation could be self-contained. It was clear that it wouldn't be used as an excuse to reopen the whole issue, that we could deal with that issue on its own, so the risks which had previously deterred me were pretty well eliminated. I'm delighted that the Home Secretary changed his mind. It shows what a broad-minded chap he is. Um, maybe he listened even more intently um, to the arguments that I um, put to him uh, in January. I remember him saying very flatteringly at the time that he thought I'd been even more eloquent than normal. The Harry Leelers knew at last that none of them would be stateless when Britain left. We were worried about for our grandchildren. They are young. After us, we are, what will happen to them? And now at least we know they belong to some place. They will have no problem with their life. We belong. We actually do belong somewhere. We're not stateless anymore. I think the credit, if you don't mind my saying, got Chris Patton. He worked very, very hard, very sincerely. I think uh, his credit is due to him. We couldn't have done it. The governor occasionally allowed himself a touch of demob happiness. Edward? Yeah. American tourist in Cambridge goes up to uh, elderly, distinguished-looking gentleman and says, uh, could you please tell me where King's College is at? So the chap stops a minute and says, I might consider telling you um, if you only understood that you can never finish a sentence with a preposition. So the tourist says, I'm so sorry, she says, um, could you tell me where King's College is at, arsehole? <laughs> okay. All right. Christine Lowe decided to set up a new political party fighting on for democracy. I'm now in full-time politics. I ran for an election. I'm going to go into the political wilderness, so to speak, for a year, but still planning to come back, fight another election. Two years before, she'd been preparing for China to phase her out after the handover. She was no longer willing to quit. I'm not going to be phased out. Nobody's going to phase me out. And I'm going to make sure that I'm not going to be phased out. 
A similar mood infected the annual memorial for the victims of Tiananmen Square, less than one month before the handover. I still don't think that uh, the chances of my being put into prison, thrown into prison, are high at all. Uh, although I obviously cannot rule out that possibility altogether. So we are staying on and fight on. But we are prepared for the worst. Although we are hoping for the best. Of course, my wife and son are worried about um, what may happen to me. But there are times when people must decide and make a choice between the community or their own families. The worry was that a noose would soon be placed around freedom's neck, throttling protest against Beijing or about Tibet or Taiwan, all in the name of patriotism. All these things before were just normal expressions of opinion. And now suddenly they take on a tinge of being acts of disloyalty or even acts against the state, something on the verge of being treasonable. I now feel that the very strong central Chinese government can interfere with my life any minute if it wishes. And this is frightening. And I don't know when it will choose to interfere. I only know that if it chooses to interfere, I shall have very little power to protect myself. Even China's most loyal advocates had private fears. Well, I... I think... Um, I'm aware that uh, there are bound to be difficulties, conflicts. But because... I mean, we all know... Uh, Chinese leaders, they have a rather different mindset than people in Hong Kong. They uh, have rather different views of things like uh, press freedom, uh, civil liberties. Right. So I think it is fair to say that uh, even so, when you hear um, a Chinese leader, a Chinese official, promising with all his sincerity that uh, there is going to be, I mean, for example, press freedom will be protected in Hong Kong after the handover. Uh, you, you simply can't be sure. He was criticized for having this on the wall the other day. Only days to go, a time for judgments. I think uh, history will say this of Chris Patton. He has consistently taken a stand on Hong Kong whenever Beijing leaders utter threats on Hong Kong. And so by doing, by standing up for Hong Kong, he has been able to strengthen the will of the Hong Kong people so they are no longer so frightened about Beijing. Kate? Hi, Kate. He failed in the most critical part of his responsibility, which is provide a smooth transition. And uh, this he failed absolutely clear. Alice, A-level exam this afternoon. It was 12 when we came. People will remember uh, uh, Mr. Patton as a China fighter, and that's about all. He has no other achievements. Laura. Laura, whose short skirt wowed Hong Kong. On reflection, though, even Patton's fiercest critics found redeeming features in his governorship. Governor Patton did make a very big contribution to the community. That is, he changed the relationship between the government and the people of Hong Kong in a very fundamental, lasting way. And he actually did it single-handedly. These are tapes of my coronary angiogram and angioplasty. So if you want a close-up of me being operated on. On closer inspection, indeed, even a China fighter was not quite beyond the pale. 
he has introduced to Hong Kong an open government. And I think, you know, it's not a game. I mean, I think it, it is something that Chris Patton introduced to Hong Kong, which will be long-lasting, which will be long, long remembered. I have assumed the administration of this government 9th of July, 1992. People have been very kind personally to me. Um, I think they, they believe that I've um, stood up for them as much as I can. I hope that's true. I think even some people who disagree with me and think that um, I haven't tried sufficiently to understand the, um, the cast of mind of a member of the Chinese Communist Party. I think even some of those who would prefer a quiet life to um, a noisy life um, think that I did my best. And um, I think they've been uh, excessively generous. In the week of his departure, the polls showed Patton to be more popular than ever, 80% support. The tycoons were unmoved. I wouldn't say he's very popular, because I certainly don't get that feeling. Certainly in the circle I, 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 I get in touch with, I don't think that he's popular at all. Normally, when you go to an airport to say goodbye to your friends, you feel you want to cry a little, hug a little. But certainly, I don't feel that that is happening inside us. I'll be glad to see him go, yes. Very much so, because I think that we can get on with our own lives from here on. In the last days, there was a meeting between the British general and his Chinese counterpart. I saw you uh, on CCTV. Did you? Yes. Despite the banter, the atmosphere was icy. Our last troops will have left by 1800 hours. Our guard oh. can take their position as from zero hour on 1st July. The Chinese had insisted on dispatching extra troops into Hong Kong before the handover. They threatened that if Britain did not consent, they'd be sent across the border in any case. And also, uh, at zero hour on 1st July, uh, our national flag uh, will be raised and also, we, on our part, will have a flag-raising ceremony as from the first stroke. There had been a compromise, but the British side remained suspicious and aggrieved by the Chinese behavior. Essentially, I can understand that you wish to um, raise your flag at um, midnight. Um, but. Um, we, at the same time, would wish to march out of the gate at midnight, when our responsibility ceases. I think um, that with um, the spirit of cooperation, it should be possible to devise um, some format that allows both those things to happen simultaneously. Um, I think we Government House acquired the feel of a theatre when a production has closed down. The stage is still there, but the set has been dismantled and the company is moving on. The bags. On oh, the bags, in that, but she, I thought we were going to put clothes in there. Right. Well, we'll, I'll talk to you. Anything you want? <sighs> well, just endless farewells, lunches, teas, dinners, till we, we feel we're, uh, we're just stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> but also, um, I've been saying goodbye to a lot of my organisations. Um, so that's been sad as well. It's, I, it's just too much emotion, really. I found on the desk. <laughs> letter from me in 1979. It must have been just after um, Alice was born. Mm. Aww. <laughs> it's often make me weep. <laughs> the nicest things are when people actually say that we're nice people. Oh, dear. 
The Royal Yacht arrived on cue. There were the Royal Marines and His Royal Highness. Everyone who's anyone was invited aboard, and they all came. The supporters, the opponents, and those who had tried to keep a foot in both camps at once. To receive the honor of knighthood and to be a knight commander, Dr. Gordon Wu Ying Sheng. There was a final investiture. I'm Hong Kong born here, and uh, I'll stay here. Although the British government has given me a British passport, but I tell you, I don't care particularly for uh, fish and chips. <laughs> I'll stay in Hong Kong, and uh, there's never in, uh, in, in, uh, in my mind that I want to leave Hong Kong. Hell no. Come hell or high water, I will stay. The class of 97, Norris Lamb is now a graduate, and she's landed a plum job in a major bank. At least enough for my family to um, start to buy a house. Right now, still, uh, we are living in public housing. And after graduate, at least I have enough money for 20 years, such kind of loan for mortgage. So you can take out the mortgage to help your parents buy a house? Yeah, sure. The Ung family had hardly changed. He's a refuse collector, she's a seamstress, still cheerful, still resigned. There are many collectors who shift out part of their collection so that they have, can adopt a, a, a wait and see attitude which was precisely Grace Wu's approach. I feel people should have a right to say what they want, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, and freedom of expression. And if that were removed... I will leave. Dick Lee is now a deputy commissioner, and he intends to stay with one proviso. I'm a professional policeman. My job is to enforce laws in Hong Kong. If I'm not happy with the system, if I'm not happy with the legislation uh, in Hong Kong, then I'll consider giving up my job as a policeman because that is against my, my principle. I just ordered the fastest motorcycle ever made by mankind, and this motorcycle is coming next week. I'm looking forward to that. I think, I think it's a shame, you know, to have your country colonized and to be a colonial subject. But I never had this sense of shame. Just because I have been too proud being a free man living this, in this colony. You know, I've been blessed with such a wonderful life. So, so long the British, may God bless you. In accordance with the standing orders of the Legislative Council, I now adjourn the council, Sine Die. The last governor's critics had warned that his confrontation with Beijing would ruin Hong Kong. In fact, Britain's last significant colony was flourishing, lively, open, and self-confident, a legacy to cherish, not destroy. I feel uh, emotionally very much on the edge, um, and uh, I suppose that's inevitable. Um, leaving uh, a job which it's been a privilege to do, uh, leaving a job which is invested with so much um, responsibility for people's well-being, leaving a job which is, I guess, um, imbued with so much symbolism um, and so many questions about honor and disgrace. Um, so I feel uh, exhausted by that. I feel as I've been through the emotional ringer already, and I, um, 
I contemplate uh, next Monday. With some concern. I've been waiting for this uh, a long, long time. I, unlike the younger generation in Hong Kong, grew up uh, in the 70s and 80s. I lived through times when the very uh, high-handed colonial nature of the British rule in Hong Kong was much more obvious. I wanted to see the end of colonial rule. You know, it is a very gratifying feeling, right? becoming masters of your own house. Government House, the final day. They'll all walk forward and they'll do a crossover of individually oh, shaking hands. Sorry, how late can this patent luggage go? Well, within, within reason, whenever. There's no rush on it, as long as we can tell them. There's no rush on it. The last thing is, as the governor and HRH move across to say farewell to the official Chinese delegation, yeah. I'll scoop up the remainder of the patents, take them on board, get them out of the way. Yeah. And the last thing is, HRH and the governor get on board, turn around, wave, okay, and we on. go. Can you check with all the other silver trays that have ER on them? Just before it's all over, there are the last pieces of legislation requiring the governor's final assent. To provide for the keeping regulation and control of dogs and okay. cats and for related matters. It's a pity we couldn't legislate in Hong Kong for the quarantine regulations in Great Britain. No, I don't like this one. Still. And then, suddenly, it's over. Yep, I think that's the last um, bit of government. The rest is saying goodbye. Lunchtime, sir. On June the 30th, 1997, Chris Patton left Government House for the last time, certain of one thing, that to stand up for Hong Kong by standing up to China. What I very much hope is that the experience we've had over the last five years it won't be simply forgotten. I hope that the waters won't just close within uh, nanoseconds, as though uh, we hadn't made some rather important points. to say it, I know, but I have a sense that 
people think I did my best.